have met to worship. Brethren, we have met to worship. We will sing the first, second, third, fourth, and fifth chorus. <laughs>
Savior.
feeling you shouting and, and dancing and jumping with me. I'm just feeling like you're just like, okay, we'll get through this in a minute. I want us to start all over again. Somebody get happy this morning. Do you realize what this song is about? I mean, I'm like, we're playing and we're we're trying to lead you in worship, and then I'm looking out there, and a few of you are worshiping, a few are like, sing a song and celebrate. Get you something out of there. I want you to be praising the Lord this morning. I want you to be listening to the words of this song this morning and thinking about the fact that you're going to be dancing with Jesus one day. Amen. I just can't do this motion anymore. We're going to have to get into the worship. Amen. Amen. Come on. Now do your best. Do your very best for Jesus. Amen. I want to hear some singing. Now, I've got hearing aids on. I'm a, I won't, don't want to have to crank them up. I want to hear you without hearing aids this morning. Amen? Amen. 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 Some and if you want to just give a little motion, amen. <laughs> if you want to just let it get down to your foot, it's okay. Let's try this song again. Amen.
the joy you feel this morning or is it folks don't get it you need to get it because that's what it is you are the bride of Christ church I remember standing at the back of the church with Aaron at the back of the church with Haley Amen. I remember standing with, with Olivia I remember standing with these brides outside and I was the place of the Holy Spirit ushering in the bride of Christ to the bridegroom who is in the place of Jesus. That's actually part of my message this morning. I want you to understand this, that when you're sitting there, and especially Aaron's is one I remember vividly because we were outside the church in the freezing, it was snowing outside, and when those doors, when they opened, And all the host was there. I couldn't move. Now, she saw her husband. But I saw the great host of heaven there. I'm telling you, you need to understand what your place is, church. You are the bride of Christ. You can be seated. I want to go ahead and get started in the message. <coughs> I want to skip prayer time and Taking up offering, we'll do that at the end. I want us to go ahead and get into the message. I want us to turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Second Timothy chapter two, verses three and four. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who has chosen him to be a soldier. There's some key words in this verse I want to start with. One of, the, one of the phrases here, the affairs of this life, and the other one, chosen, chosen. Do you realize that you've been chosen today? Do you realize that you are a chosen bride? You are a chosen church. That God chose you before the foundations of the earth. Before he ever created the world, he saw 2020 and you sitting right here on his seats. He saw you and I right here in this room. He saw these people that are joining us on the internet. He saw all these folks. He saw them and he said, that's my bride. When a man goes out to choose a bride, he often looks for beauty, but he looks for more than beauty. If he's a good man and he has wisdom, he looks for someone who is going to be a good mother to his children. He looks for someone who's got a good heart. He looks for someone who's going to help him in life. Someone who's going to match him and be equally yoked with him. He looks for someone who will compliment him and not drag him down and not 
belittle him and not um, be unfaithful to him. And my, my message this morning is called The Affairs of This Life. The Affairs of This Life. And you know, we look at that and we see the, uh, the literal soldier who's being um, trained as a excuse me <coughs> trained as a soldier and he isn't entangled with affairs outside his personal life he's not he doesn't have to worry about where he's going to get his food the military takes care of that right he doesn't have to worry about where his, where his clothing is going to come for or his gear or his weaponry the military takes care of that he doesn't have to worry about anything except get up in the right time every day and go to bed. He's not allowed during boot camp to contact his family. Did y'all remember that when Jacob went in the Navy? He wasn't allowed to write home. He's not allowed to contact people for a certain length of time because they want to focus his mind. Let me ask you this. Is that you? Have you focused your mind on Christ? Have you spent time this week Besides this short, brief time of prayer before our church service, have you spent time with him? Or are you waiting for church so, well, I don't have to read my Bible because we, we read it during Sunday. Are you thinking about everything else in the world except God? And then when you come here, you think about God because you're looking at me and I'm talking about it. What time of the week do you think about God? Every day? When you get in trouble? Do you think about how much better life is going to be. You know, we think about, we got to make a better life. There's nothing wrong with making your life a little easier if you can, but this is not all there is. We are the bride of Christ, and I, I intentionally chose that last song for the words in it because I'm focused on the fact that you are supposed to be the spotless bride of Christ. You know what that means? Unsoiled. Think about these brides that come down in their pure white clothes. I mean, you've, you've been around and you've seen the care that goes into these dresses. You've seen the expense and the time that goes into these dresses and the decoration that goes into these dresses. And when they come down through there for all to behold, imagine if there's a big oil stain right here. Because right before the wedding, the bride crawled into the car and changed her oil. Well, that's silly, isn't it? And nobody would do that. But think about what, what have you done right before the bridegroom came back to get you? What ridiculous things you've done in this world that has soiled your garment? Now I want us to look at basically the fact of unfaithfulness this morning. I started to I started to just say unfaithfulness. And I think I just titled it on, on the message unfaithfulness. So if you want to call it unfaithfulness, unfaithful you can but I want us to I want us to look at the fact of, of being unfaithful and think about marriages this is this is he's using the terms the affairs of this life and, and we have another picture when we use the word affair for something if you talk about a husband having an affair what do you think about being unfaithful right I want you to think along those lines this morning the affairs of this life think about if you're having affairs with the world or not, are you being unfaithful to Christ this morning? You might not think so. I got to tell you, years ago, I was a lot more flirtatious with other women. I had no idea how it hurt my wife. And I got the understanding of it one day, and it really broke my heart. That even though I was not being physically unfaithful to her, that I was not being true to her all the time in my heart, in my mind. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 5. Now this is a passage we often read at weddings. Ephesians chapter 5. We use these passages when we're looking at teaching for marriage counseling but I want you to look at the real depth of this scripture this morning Ephesians 5 and 25 husbands love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it 
that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man yet, ever yet, hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord, the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Now look at the analogy that Paul gives here in marriage. That he is giving the analogy that the husband and the wife are a beautiful picture of the church. That there are so many bad marriages in this world and so many marriages that fall apart. Because the children don't understand the picture of Christ in the church. You know, you could be married for 70 years and die and thinking you had a successful marriage, but if you did not portray Christ in the church, you failed. It doesn't matter if you stayed married to the end of your life and you fought every day of your life. It doesn't matter how many years you've got behind you or how many anniversaries you celebrated. If every day of your life your children saw you bickering, every day of your marriage your children saw you, saw the husband be unfaithful, saw the wife not reverencing her husband, and saw, saw disunity there. They do not understand the picture of the church. It's no wonder we don't understand what the church's role is because we don't understand the role of a wife. We don't understand the role of a husband. It's no wonder we fail as Christians of being spotless because we can't even be spotless in our own personal relationships, can we? Look at, look at the way he says that. Verse 27, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that he should be holy and without blemish. Verse 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word. The husband purified by his deep love for her. He makes her want to only love him if he's doing his job. He makes her desire him and long for him. He is romantic. He, he cultures that relationship and, and basically uh, pursues her so that she wants to love him. He makes it worth her time. He, he makes her believe that he is the one who's going to be there till death do us part. Right? It's not something that, that uh, happens over a few minutes is something that happens over a lifetime. That that husband, his job is to continually pursue his wife. Christ is continually pursuing you. He is continuing to be romantic to you, if you will. He is continuing to love you and to cherish you as a bride. He is continuing to be there for you and to do everything within his power. And that's a lot of power. To do everything that he can to win you over. But think about when the husband's away, when he's off on a trip, or when the bridegroom's away, as, as we read about in the Scripture. And he's coming back. He's soon coming, bridegroom. When you read about that, then if there's not some kind of bond there, then what's going to happen with the bride-to-be? What's going to happen with her and her relationship? What's going to happen that... She's not going to remember her. And maybe she'll have some other men come around and say, he won't be back to you anytime soon. Why don't you and I just strike up a relationship? And there'll be other men try to come in and try to win her over during that time when he's away. What happens then? What if he only comes back every week or every month or twice a year? What if he only comes back? Or what if he just writes letters? But during World War II, I remember a lot of stories about men getting Dear John letters, right? Women would promise to marry these men, and when they were away at war, they got a, what was known as a Dear John letter, where, where it would be uh, 
I'm sorry to tell you this, but I found another man while you've been off at war. I found another man. You know, the church is that way largely. We've been unfaithful to Christ. We have not been faithful, have we? We are not the spotless bride of Christ that he deserves. We've got to be very cautious. We have got to make sure we keep ourselves pure. And it's on an individual level, but also on a corporate level of the church because we individually can be like a spot on the bridegroom's dress, but we can also be corporately, we can be the entire sleeve, right? We can be the entire denomination. We can be the entire church, right? We, we can be unfaithful and be, and be uh, spotted like that. And we need to make sure that we are, our part, is unblemished, right? We have a, a personal responsibility. You know, you may look around and see a lot of other Christians, well, everybody else is doing it. That does not mean that you do not have a responsibility then that you not, will not be held accountable when he comes. I want to be there. I don't know about you. I want to be there. I want to be the spotless bride of Christ. Let's look at um, James 4.4. 4. James 4.4. 4. <clears throat> you adulterers and adulteresses. Wow, wait just a minute. Can you believe that James uses that terminology? Adulterers and adulteresses. For you young people, you may not understand what adultery is. That's one of the Ten Commandments that God said, Thou shalt not. Adultery is when a husband and wife that already have a relationship established, the husband goes off and finds another woman. He's having a, a relationship with another woman that's not his wife, and that's adultery. And here, James compares this. He looked, adultery, adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Wow. Do you get the, the depth of what I'm sharing with you this morning? Do you see that if you're a friend of the world, you're the enemy of God? Let that strike you just a moment. We want to be friends with everybody. We think that's the way we're supposed to be. Well, it says love our enemies does not say you're supposed to be friends with them. It says you're supposed to be unequally yoked, doesn't it? Well, what do we want to do? We want to get as many friends on Facebook as we can. Come on, be my friend. I get a lot of friend requests every week, and the first thing I do is go in there and see who this person is and see what is on their wall, see what they presented, and if there is no sign of them being born again, I do not friend them. Now that may be harsh, but I'm not supposed to be a friend of the world. I'm not supposed to be a friend of the world. That makes me an adulterer. Do you understand that? That if you've got all these friends, well, it's okay. We've got some non-Christian friends. Why? Why? Why do you have non-Christian friends? Or why do you have friends that claim they're Christians and you know good and well they're not? They are not living the life of Christ. They are not living the life that they claim to be. You know them personally and you know they're not walking with God or they are an abomination before Him and you're friends with them. Why? Well, maybe I could win them over. When I was a youth pastor, there used to be a lot of missionary dating going on. There would be people bringing in these dates to these events that I had and they would not be saved boys and saved girls. They would be bringing in these people that were not born again. And I had one in my in my youth group that actually married a young man and, and the woman just out and out told me, she, he's not a Christian. He doesn't even believe in God. Why would you marry somebody like that? Why would you marry a person that's not born again? Why have relationships like that? Friendship with the world. 
is in enmity with God. If you're a friend of the world, you're the enemy of God. I don't want to be God's enemy. For the sake of the world, is it worth it? You can have lots of friends and they can pat you on the back and they can tell you what a good person you are and they can make you feel happy and, and have a lot of fun with them and do lots of things with them. And you can share in the same hobbies and then all of a sudden, Jesus comes back and he says, what about me? If you're a friend of the, of the world, you're not God's friend and you're his enemy. Look at um, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. 1 Corinthians 6, 9. Corinthians 6 9 Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Well, we just read a passage about if you're a friend of the world, you're an adulterer or adulteress. And here he says that adulterers will not inherit the kingdom of God. If you're not faithful to Christ, it doesn't matter if you had a relationship a long time ago or you had a one-time attraction to the church or one-time thing with Christianity or you joined a church or whatever it is. If you, if you had a one-time thing, it does not matter. You know, a, a boy can propose to a girl and she can say, yes, and I'll marry you, and then she can go out and be unfaithful. Do you think that makes her his, his wife? Do you think he's going to marry her? Consequently, the girl can tell the boy he, she'll marry him, and he can go out and just start chasing other women. Do you think she's going to marry that? He said that adulterers will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now I'm going to show you some scriptures in the Old Testament. Look at Malachi chapter 2, verse 11. That's the last book of the Bible, or the Old Testament, Malachi chapter 2. <coughs> Malachi 2, verse 11. <coughs> Judah hath dealt treacherously, and an abomination is committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah hath profaned the holiness of the Lord, which he loved, and hath married the daughter of a strange God. The Lord will cut off the man that doeth this, the master of the scholar, out of the tabernacles of Jacob, and him that offereth an offering unto the Lord of hosts. And this have ye done again, covering the altar of the Lord with tears and with weeping and with crying out, insomuch that he regardeth not the offering any more, or receiveth it with good with good will at your hand. Yet you say, Wherefore? Because the Lord hath been witness between thee and the wife of thy youth, against whom thou hast dealt treacherously. Yet is she thy companion and the wife of thy, thy covenant? And did not he make one? Yet he made the residue of the spirit, and wherefore one? That he might seek a godly seed, Therefore take heed to your spirit, and let none deal treacherously with the wife of his youth. For the Lord, the God of Israel, saith that he hateth putting away. For one covereth violence with his garment, saith the Lord of hosts. Therefore take heed to your spirit, that ye deal not treacherously. Now what he's talking about here is twofold. He's talking about Israel being unfaithful to him, and he's talking about the men of Israel being unfaithful to their wives. There's two things happening. So many times it's happening in the church, it's, it's a spiritual thing and it's a physical thing. It's, it's manifest in the way that we live forth. We can come before and we can put on a big air before the church and we can act like we're all holy and we can wave our hands and sing our songs and pay our tithes and do everything that we're supposed to be doing 
and look very religious and yet have an evil heart. We can fool everybody but God. But the truth is, somewhere along in your week, in your life, you're dealing with other people the same way. You cannot fake the relationship with God and have a great relationship with everybody around you. <clears throat> All the time, Angie and I are talking about these people that are in fame, the, the rich and famous people of this, <coughs> excuse me, of this world, the people that are movie stars and wealthy business people, and they act like they can do it all without God. They act like they can do whatever they need to and be okay. You know, they can live an immoral lifestyle. Well, they're normal. That's just the new normal. That's just the way it is for them. They were born that way. Right? They can make you believe that they're, they're good people too. And yet it'll come out in the news that they were unrighteous. I mean, we already know the unrighteousness because they're living in it, but they're acting like, well, this is the normal way to live. This is normal for me. And yet they'll come out in some, thank you so much, <coughs> some kind of scandal that everybody turns against them, right? Mm -hmm. Happens all the time. Israel was unfaithful to God with other gods. Did you see that in verse 11? They hath married the daughter of a strange god. You know what they would do? They'd go through all the rituals and motions of the tabernacle, and then they would go out and they would build altars to Baal. And they would sacrifice their children to, to another god. Well, I've got several children. Right? You know what? We're sacrificing our children to other gods. Anytime that we, we do something for them, we, we lead them astray. We're doing it. We're sacrificing our children to other gods when we give them over to the things of this world and we, we let them know that it's okay to be that way. It's okay to live this way. It's okay to, to love certain things of this world. Or you need to find God if, if He's for you. You need to, you know, I've, I've heard people say that. Well, I'm a Christian, but I don't want to push that on Him. He might end up being a Buddhist. How ridiculous is that? I would say that you're not a Christian because if you was, you would know that only Christ is the way to heaven. He is the only way you'll get there. And if you don't believe that, you're not a Christian. That's what he said. Israel was being unfaithful to, the, to Jehovah God. And not only this, the men were being unfaithful to their wives. And he talks about that being dealing treacherously with the wife of your youth. Now look in verse 16. For the Lord, the God of Israel, saith that he hateth putting away. You know what that putting away means? It means divorce. The modern translations translate that, that God hates divorce. He hates it. I think the, the statistics are probably the same as they were the last time I checked. It's been several years back. It may even be worse now. But for years and years in the church, the divorce rate was 50%, which is about what it is in the world. That's wrong. Why are we even going to church if our lives are not different? Why are we even reading this book if it makes no difference in our lives? Why? What's the difference? The divorce rate in this country is ridiculous. And even it's even higher than that. I was reading about some movie star a couple of nights ago, wondering about them, I, some movie I saw or whatever, and I was wondering about this one particular person. When I read, it's like, married the first time to so-and-so for two years, married the second time, married the third time, married the fourth time, married the fifth time, married the sixth time. And I'm thinking, give it up. You're not good at this, you know? Just, just give it up. Why be married five, six, seven times? And, and I think in some states you can't even be married that many times. And I know people that have reached their limit. Wow, you know? And that's, that's life. And, he, and here he said, God hates divorce. Now, he does not hate divorced people. He loves you if you're divorced, right? He loves divorced people. He hates divorce. Now, I'm about to show you something most people have never read in the Bible. 
Look at Jeremiah chapter 3, <clears throat> verse 1. We're going to read 15 verses in Jeremiah. You might even be shocked at this. Jeremiah chapter 3. We just read that God hates divorce. <clears throat> now remember that we're looking at unfaithfulness to God. But we also want to think about unfaithfulness between a husband and wife. Unfaithfulness in our relationships. <clears throat> and here in, in Jeremiah 3, chapter 1, he begins to talk about being some, a man putting away his wife and just understand that that is divorce. When a man put his wife away, that's divorce. Jeremiah 3, 1. They say if a man put away his wife and she go from him and become another man's, shall he return unto her again? Shall not that land be greatly polluted? But thou hast played the harlot with many lovers, yet thou return again to me, saith the Lord. Lift up thine eyes unto the high places, and see where thou hast not been blind with, in the ways thou sat for them, as the Arabian in the wilderness, and thou hast polluted the land with thy whoredoms and with thy wickedness. Therefore the showers have been withholden, and there hath been no latter rain, and thou hast a whore's forehead. Thou refusest to be ashamed. Wilt thou not from this time cry unto me, My father, thou art the guide of my youth. Will he reserve his anger forever? Will he keep it to the end? Behold, thou hast spoken and done evil things as thou couldst. <clears throat> the Lord also said also unto me in the days of Josiah the king, Hast thou seen that which backsliding Israel hath done? She has gone up upon every high mountain and under every green tree, and there played the harlot. And I said after she had done this, all these things, Turn thou unto me, but she returneth not. And her treacherous sister Judah saw it. And I saw when all, excuse me, when for all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery, I had put her away. Did you just read that God just divorced Israel? Read that verse 8 again. And I saw when for all the causes whereby backsliding Israel put, committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a bill of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Judah feared not but went out and played the harlot also. And it came to pass through the lightness of her whoredom that she defiled the, land, defiled the land and committed adultery with stones and with stocks. And yet for all this, her treacherous sister Judah hath not turned unto me with her whole heart, but faintly said the Lord. And the Lord saith, said unto me, The backsliding Israel hath justified herself more than treacherous Judah. Go and proclaim these words toward the north and say, Return thou backsliding Israel, saith the Lord, and I will not cause mine anger to fall upon you. For I am merciful, saith the Lord, and I will not keep anger forever. Only acknowledge thine iniquity, that thou hast transgressed against the Lord thy God, and hast scattered thy ways to the strangers and under every green tree. And ye have not obeyed my voice, saith the Lord. Turn all backsliding children, saith the Lord, for I am married unto you, and I will take you one of a city and two of a family and I will bring you to Zion and I will give you pastors according to mine heart which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding I hope that I'm a pastor according to his heart and that I'm feeding you with knowledge and understanding this morning I'm sharing something that is hard to understand I'm sharing something that you need to know and that is if God divorced Israel do you think he would divorce you If you're unfaithful to him, do you not think that he will stay with you and say, well, it's okay? Do you think that he's going to treat you differently? Do you think that God is going to just say, I love her anyway. She's unfaithful to me, but I love her anyway. Are you friends with the world? Do you see that this world is the joy of your life? Or are you like that last song we sing? We will dance on the streets that are golden. The glorious bride and the great son of man from every tongue and tribe and nation will join in the song of the Lamb. Is that you? Do you desire that? Or are you looking for the next thing you can buy on Amazon? Are you looking for, well, I'm trying to make money. I'm trying to have a little more fun in this world. 
Well, God gave me this body, and I'm going to show it off a little. God made me this way. I know that I'm kind of rough around the edges, but he made me this way. I didn't make you that way. You were born into sin. You were born in a situation where you needed a Savior. You were born in a place and a time where you needed to be saved. And you can get out in the world and play around and think, I'll just come back when I want to. Or I know he'll take me back. Have you ever seen women do that? They go out and they chase other guys and they think, he'll take me back. I knew a guy one time who uh, had a woman that kept leaving him and she'd come back every year at uh, bonus time. About two weeks before the bonus showed up every year, she'd start having a relationship with him again and, and kind of stringing him along. And after a while, he caught on to it. And one of those head slap moments, wow, this woman's playing me. Do you see how people in the church play God? Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about playing like they are God. They, they play this game with God, so to speak, where that they only come before God when they get in trouble. They only come before God when the blessings are being poured out. Have you ever been in a church where people sit around there in the, in the different aisles and the different seats and then all of a sudden they come in one day and they've got some bad report from the doctor or they come in and the husband's lost his job and they get right on the front row of church. I'm getting focused on God now. All right, God, I'm listening to you. You got my attention. Wouldn't it be better for him to have your attention all the time? Mm -hmm. You know what? This woman in this back corner has got my attention all the time. It's, sometimes I don't hear, and that, that's true, when she calls. But when she calls, I come. When she says, I need you, if, she, if I was at work back when we were going to work, you know, back when we had offices we went to, when I, back when I was at work, several times she called me on the phone and say, honey, I need you to come home right now. And I'd say, I'm on the way. She didn't have to explain to me what it was. She has my full attention. How about you? If your God calls you today and says, Paul, Haley, Andy, would you say, yes, Lord, but I will be done? Would you come right now? Is your heart that in tune with your God that you would come right now and say, whatever it is, Lord, or do you say, let me think about it a minute, God? I'm kind of busy. And you wait until you need Him. Is that your relationship with God? I'm going to finish up in Hosea chapter 1. Go ahead and find Hosea. It's right after the book of Daniel. <clears throat> Those of you who know Hosea know that it's an awesome book with a very strange message. If you read the first chapter of Hosea, you will be blown away if you really read it and understand it. It's passages that preachers hardly ever talk about because they don't want the controversy. They don't want to have to answer questions or they think they ought to have quick answers to it or it doesn't make sense. It's kind of like God saying to Abraham, you know that son that I promised you for years and years? Okay, now I want you to go sacrifice him. Wait a minute, aren't you the God Jehovah that doesn't believe in us killing humans? And now you're, I don't understand that. Now this, this we're about to read was for a prophet. This was for a man who stood there, who stood there before the people of Israel as a symbol of what was going on in Israel. You know, this man had to do certain things. You know, some of the prophets, by our standards, were weird people, right? I think it was it Isaiah that walked around naked for three years. To sh huh? Yeah, I, I think it was. He, 
God told him to go without clothes to show Israel you're naked. You're destitute. Wow. I'm glad I'm not a prophet, you know? And you can be glad I'm not a prophet too. You know, I mean, God asked prophets to do hard things to show Israel so that they were a living testimony to Israel, right? Look in Hosea chapter 1, and that's all I'm going to look at is chapter 1. The word of the Lord that came unto Hosea, the son of Beri, in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel. The beginning of the word of the Lord by Hosea, and the Lord said to Hosea, Go take unto thee a wife of whoredoms and children of whoredoms, for the land hath committed great whoredom, departing from the Lord. God told this prophet to go marry an unfaithful woman. Now we are asked to do hard things sometimes, but I don't know if, I, if my heart could take marrying someone that I know immediately is not going to be faithful to me. And she's going to have children by other men. I want this to stop back here between these two boys. God told Hosea to marry this woman. Her name was Gomer. Marry Gomer. She's not going to be faithful to you, and she's going to have children by other men. Could you marry a woman like that? Look what happens. Verse 3, So he went and took Gomer, the daughter of Deblaim, which con conceived and bare him a son. Now, do you know, he already told her, these they're not going to be your children. So she conceived and bare him a son. She's already unfaithful to him. And the Lord said unto him, Call his name Jezreel for yet a little while, and I will avenge the blood of Jezreel upon the house of Jehu, and will cause to cease the kingdom of the house of Israel. Now Jezreel means God sows. So God is sowing seed. He is planting something. He's got something created here. He's got something that he started. Verse 5, And it came to, shall come to pass at that day that I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel, and she conceived again and bare a daughter. And God said unto him, Call her name Lo Ruhama, for I will no more have mercy upon the house of Israel. Lo Ruhama means no mercy. Now he's got one child named God So. Well, that doesn't sound too bad. Then he's got another child, a daughter, and he names her No Mercy. You know, that's not something we want to name our children. Verse 7, But I will have mercy upon the house of Judah and will save them by the Lord their God and will not save them by bow, nor by sword, nor by battle, nor by horses, nor by horsemen. Now when she had weaned Lo Ruhema, she conceived and bare a son. Now here's another person, possibly a third man that she's had children by. Then said God, Call his name Lo am I, for you are not my people and I will not be your God. The last child is named you're not man. You're not man. The names meant something. The names were there prophetically telling Israel, this is what you're doing. This is you. Do you see this prophet? Everybody in the town knows this woman, knows what she's like. They know that she sleeps around. They know, I know that child's not even his. And God says, it's you. Israel, you're unfaithful to me. You've had children by other gods. You've had offspring by other gods. You've not been faithful to me. You see what the prophet's going through? That's what I'm going through. You know, being a pastor is hard when you see people living their life in sin. When you see people that will not turn around, when you see people hurting each other, when you see people who will not turn to God and living for themselves, it hurts. Because it hurts God. If that pastor's in tune, he knows what God's feeling. He knows what's happening. And the poor prophet was obedient to God. Verse 10, yet the 
the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured nor numbered. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, Ye are not my people, there it shall be said unto them, Ye are the sons of the living God. You see, there's something that can take place here that he can adopt these children. Hosea can adopt these children and say, even though they're not mine, they're going to be mine. I'm going to be their father. Right? I'm going to take it, take it on myself to raise them. And she went out later. If you read through this book, you'll be blown away by the fact that at some point God tells him, go back and redeem her. And he goes back and he says, you won't play the harlot anymore. You're going to come and be faithful to me again. That's the call of God today to you, church. He's calling and he says, you might have been unfaithful in the past. You might have had children by other gods. You might have been out sowing wild seed. But today is the day of salvation. Today is the day when you can come back to me. And even though you've been unfaithful to me, I want you to be my wife. Even though you've spotted your bridal gown, here's a new one. Here's a new bride gown. Here's something that you can put on and you can be a virgin again. Right? That's God today. That's God's mercy on you today. There's a time when He turns His back on you and you have, you have ignored Him. You've gone out and been unfaithful to Him. But God says today, today is the day of salvation. Today is the day when I want you to come back to me. I'm calling you today. Imagine a story, if you will, of a man and woman where he's, he has wooed her and, and been romantic to her and he's pursued her and he's tried everything to win her over and she gives in to him but she's just really playing a game with him. She's just doing these mind games. Have you ever looked at the personal ads in some of the local papers? We have a little, um, little local paper here where you can put in free ads and there's these people that, there's like a personals column and people in there, you know, and I always love the ones of the people writing from prison, the wanting somebody to, to pen pal with them and the people say, love to go for long walks. And I'm thinking, you, how long a walk can you go when you're in prison, you know? But, but I, and most of the time, I read in there that just out of curiosity and some of the things say, no mind games. <laughs> no mind games. Because there's so many people that do that. They like, they like flirting and they like the affection, but they don't really want to commit. It means men and women. It's not just one side. They like, they like to play. They like the, the game of playing around with relationships. And that person that says no mind games, they don't want that. They want something solid. They want a real relationship. God wants a real relationship with you today. He doesn't want mind games. He didn't want you playing around with him and telling something that's not true. Telling him, yes, Lord, I will love you. I'm giving you my heart for the rest of my life. Did you really? That day when you said, Lord, I want Jesus to be my Lord and Savior. Is that till death do its part? Did you, did you uh, receive Christ with the understanding that it's a lifetime thing? Or did you make a commitment some time ago and you never kept that commitment? Let me tell you something. God is calling you up on that today. He is calling you calling out your statement that you were faithful, you will be faithful to Him. He is calling you out, and He wants you to be faithful to Him just like Gomer was faithful to. And I believe she was. I believe that that was the symbol that Israel would be faithful to God. I think that, that, that they saw that. So maybe somebody left the community and came back years later and said, whatever happened to that crazy prophet? that had that wife that slept around someone. Whatever happened to that? That was the big scandal of Israel. Whatever happened? And somebody said, oh, haven't you heard? He adopted all those children, and he married that woman again, and she's been faithful to him. In fact, she's a great woman of God. That's the story of the church. Read through Revelation. Read through Revelation of all the seven churches of Revelation, and you will find that even though these churches, all but one, have something disastrous that God calls them out on, he says, if you'll return to me and will be faithful, you'll give you a crown of life. Right? Crown of life. Be faithful to me. Be faithful in the death. So when I close today, I want to ask you this. 
have you been unfaithful to God? I would say most of us could say yes. At some point, at some level, we've been unfaithful to God. We've not been faithful like we should. We've not been faithful in prayer. We've not been faithful in reading our Bibles. We've not been faithful in worship. We've not been faithful to daily get up and start our day with Him. You know what the first thing I do when I get up is I kiss her. I don't get out and go about my day and then think, oh, I haven't even talked to Angie today. I begin my day with her. Do you begin your day with God? I know that life gets busy and I know you get up and you've got kids to take care of. And, you know, well, maybe that's how you get up is the kids wake you every morning and you get up and you, the husband's got to get off of work. Or the husband, take, he's got to think about what he's going to do today on his job or like Andy gets called out and stuff. But life's busy. I understand that. You've got to take time for God. We can't be too, too busy for our spouse and we can't be too busy for God. We've got to be faithful to Him. Amen? So I'm calling you today, church, and asking you to be faithful to the one true God. To be faithful to Him. To give over everything that you've been unfaithful to in the past. To ask for forgiveness. To come back to Him. He's calling you like He called Hosea. Let me just turn there while I've got our Bibles there. <clears throat> chapter 3. Hosea chapter 3. Then said the Lord unto me, Go yet, love a woman beloved of her friend, yet an adulteress, according to the, Lord, the love of the Lord, toward the children of Israel, who look to other gods and love flagons of wine. So I bought her to me for 15 pieces of silver and for an omer of barley and a half omer of barley. And I said unto her, Thou shalt abide for me many days, and shalt not play the harlot, and thou shalt not be for another man, so will I also be for thee. God's calling you today, and he says, I want to redeem you. I want to redeem you. We had something years ago, but I want to redeem you again. I want to bring you back to me. I want you to be mine, and you will not be unfaithful from this day forward. Can you say that today, church, that you won't be unfaithful to him from this day forward? Let's make that commitment today, today in prayer. Father, I just come before you today asking that you help us to commit to you what you deserve, Lord. You deserve a bride that's not spotted by this world, that's not friends with this world, that does not see this world as the end all and the be all of their life. They see this, Lord, as a, a place that they will endure until they get to heaven. Lord, when we step into heaven, let it be something that we know that we've endured this life for, something that Christ paid for and redeemed us for, and something that we were faithful unto death for. Lord, I pray that those who are struggling today, uh, being unfaithful with the world, Lord, unfaithful with the other gods, unfaithful with the things of this world, Lord, I pray that we, that, that would be taken out and we would have nothing but the sight of Jesus, that it would be nothing, Father, but that Lord that we love. Our first love, Lord. That God that saved us, that Jesus that hung on the cross, that Jesus that loved us, who's so tenderly calling us back like the prodigal son's father, watching for us as we come across the field, ever watching, Lord. You are patient with your church, and your church has not been faithful to you. And I pray, Father, today that men and women would come back out of this world and would come before you, Lord, and bow before you and be your servant again. And it would be like the prodigal son and say, I'd rather be a servant in your house. But you, like a God that you are, will come before and say, Lord, say that you are the Father and, I, and they are the Son. Lord, call us out again. Give us that desire to come before you, Lord. Give us that desire to spend daily time with you and constant time with you in prayer. Help us to be the bride that, that your son deserves. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.